Today we're going to talk a little bit about design considerations when you want to go to alternative energy and that includes things like photovoltaics, wind power, steam, hydrogen, those types of things and I've looked into most all of those but I've pretty much just settled on solar as the, the meat and potatoes producer of electricity. Uh, there's a general rule of thumb, anything with moving parts breaks and wears out. Solar panels, I admit, aren't as pretty to look at as a wind generator that sits there and spins in the wind, but they sit there and quietly make electricity and they never wear out, and it takes a mighty big hailstone to break one, so hail really isn't a very big consideration, and if you've got home insurance, you're going to be covered anyway. Um, but anyway, uh, back when I first got into uh, solar power, uh, the thing that I had noticed was you always had to size the, the photovoltaic panels and your battery equally so that the array would be big enough to charge the batteries and yet the batteries wouldn't be so small that the panels would overdrive the batteries and overcharge them and, and ruin them. And also back then uh, halogen bulbs were pretty popular to be used for lighting. Uh, LCD and LED TVs didn't exist. Uh, things were a lot different then than they are now and whenever they came out with this MPPT charge controller or maximum power point tracking uh, this really opened up a whole new world in uh, the arena of, uh, of uh, photovoltaics and what I like about this one from Schneider Electric the Xantrex XW it's MPPT 6150 it has a maximum output of 60 amps uh, I've got a 48 volt battery bank. You can see here that uh, uh, my input is sitting at 37 and a half amps right now, but my output is 49 amps. 36 amps in and out is 48 amps. So you can see that's a difference of 12 amps. Uh, the reason for that is is the photovoltaic array is wired at 120 volts and I can bring that in and um, it's uh, uh, automatically down converted. There's a formula that uh, has to do with watts, amps, and volts and I'm not going to get real technical with that but anyway it has the capability of bringing that voltage down to the battery level and raising the amperage up. Now why would you do that you might ask. Well in my case it allows me to have the solar panels located a hundred feet away from the battery room out to where there's plenty of sunshine and the battery room up by the trees so that it gets a little more shade during the day and doesn't get so hot. A maximum power point tracker, another nice thing about that is even when the sun is sitting on the horizon or if it's very very cloudy you still get that higher voltage that you don't get whenever they're wired for the same voltage as the battery. So as a result, you get charging power for the batteries uh, where you wouldn't get any charging at all if they were wired at a closer voltage to the batteries. Uh, moving along here on the, uh, the charge controller, you can see today that uh, we've generated 7.12 kilowatt hours already. Um, the time that it's been online has been 3 hours and 47 minutes. So. You know, we're talking about it's about 10 o'clock. It's in the absorb charging mode and aux on. The aux on shows that that is the uh, uh, water heater. The water heater is actually turned on and it's generating electricity. You can hear the fans from the inverter behind me. Uh, they're running to keep the inverter cool because it's generating a little bit of heat uh, to produce that power that the water heater requires. Uh, we can go look at the different menus. What I'm going to look at right now is the aux menu to show how that works. Uh, the aux control, I've got it set to automatic right now, but you can change it to manually off or you can change it to manually on. Uh, that way you can override whatever, the, the, whatever it's doing at the moment if you need to test. My trigger source is set for a high battery voltage. It triggers when the voltage reaches 57.5 volts and then it clears or the relay releases at 55 and a half volts. Uh, the trigger delay and clear delay is zero seconds. You can have a delay there uh, if you're using some kind of a relay that doesn't like being turned on and off very often. The output level is 12 volts so the solid state relays are happy with that. 
and the output mode is an active high. Active low would mean that the relay would normally be on and then it would turn off when the re voltage reaches a certain voltage. So this charger has really uh, opened up a whole new way of thinking in the uh, photovoltaic and, and alternative energy fields. Uh, one of the things that it's really done that, that's helped out a bunch is we don't have to consider the battery bank so much anymore. If, if we can move all of our heavy electrical usage to during the day, most of us are going to use uh, the air compressors, the stove, the oven, um, the well pump for watering the grass or whatever. All these things are going to be done primarily during the day anyway. Um, in a situation like this, we'd want to make sure of that. Uh, the, the charge controller uh, having the uh, aux output on it to run diversion loads. What I like about it particularly is we use it to heat water first and then once the water's hot then that thermostat trips on another device once the water's hot and uh, say for instance an air compressor and then once the air has gotten up to its pressure and the air compressor kicks off then you can have another relay trip and uh, that could go into say a, a, a water well where you could open up another pressure tank and, and pump that pressure tank full so that it doesn't run as much at night and then once that's done then you can finally divert that off into uh, say in my case uh, the heat pumps that we use on the house uh, you can just keep going on and on down the line you just want to prioritize and put your most important diversion loads first in my case the hot water and then after that the air and then after that the uh, the heat pumps so uh, once you've found other places that you can store that energy for later use now you've uh, uh, lessened the requirement on the batteries your batteries last longer you can use a smaller battery bank uh, and you're not digging into them nearly as much as uh, uh, as, as we did back uh, in the days before maximum power point tracking charging was out so that's one of the things to consider, where you can put this other excess energy. Um, in my opinion, solar water heaters are kind of a waste of money just because uh, they only work marginally well during the winter. They do work well in the summer, but in the winter time, I just, I, I didn't get the kinds of performance out of them that the manufacturers claimed, and I still ended up having to use a backup propane heater, where by using electricity now, I, we've had plenty of hot water constantly. Another thing that we had back then was uh, halogen bulbs was about the most efficient. Then they came out with PL fluorescence. Then of course the CFLs that everyone knows now and now the LEDs. Uh, the LED lights that we use, uh, we can get an LED light that uses about 10 watts and it'll put out the light of about a 75 watt light bulb. Uh, we got floodlights on the house that are LED uh, the lights that we use in the living room fixtures uh, in the ceiling fans I'm converting over to LEDs that use such a small amount they don't even register on my kilowatt hour meter at all until I get about four of them in the ceiling fan and then they register about one and a half watts. Uh, granted it's not bright as the sun bright but it's plenty of light that uh, we can see the keyboards on the computers, the keys on the remote control. Uh, we don't really need that much light when we're uh, doing stuff in the evening. You only need enough light to see. Uh, and then our table lamps are the brighter lights that we use for reading. We'll have the 8-watt uh, LED lights in those uh, that we just got from Home Depot for about 10 bucks. They work great. Uh, they put out a lot of light. Uh, so we use those on the end tables. The, uh, Overheads use the extremely low wattage bulbs, and that works very well for us. Uh, another consideration is your appliances on the refrigerators, for instance. Uh, I incorrectly said that ours was a Sears Kenmore, and it's not, it's a Frigidaire. But uh, when you're looking at refrigerators, you want to find, I think it's called a Tier 3 or a Level 3 Energy Star rated refrigerator and that means that it uses very little compared to regular conventional refrigerators they don't cost that much more you know maybe 10 or 15 percent more than uh, a cheaper refrigerator 
Uh, another consideration is uh, your washing machines. A uh, front-loading washing machine is going to use an average of about 200 watts as opposed to 1500 watts for a top-loading washing machine. Uh, back in the day whenever I did my first setup, I, I bought a uh, washing machine conversion kit that converted it to a, a DC motor and it pulled about 400 watts and boy that was a big deal back then because now I didn't need a 2500 watt inverter to run it. Well now uh, these front loaders like this one that we have that's a Whirlpool tops out at about 180 watts uh, whenever it's on a spin cycle and uh, whenever it's just washing clothes it'll pull anywhere from about 5 watts to 40, 50, 60 watts so uh, appliances are another consideration uh, your point of use, more efficient appliances means that uh, you can use a smaller battery bank uh, you've got more power left over to use elsewhere uh, those are things to consider about so uh, hope that helped out a little bit I'm gonna make some more videos I'll go a little bit more in depth on my water heating system and uh, I'll also go into more detail about uh, uh, my charging system and load diversions and the panels and that type of thing in future videos thank you for those of you that are subscribing and uh, I'll keep them coming uh, any questions, just uh, post them out there and I'll answer them. Thank you. Yeah.